What's happening, everyone? I'm Justin Woodward, co-founder of the Media Indie Exchange, The Mix, and one of the producers behind the Gorilla Collective, helping to organize the show alongside our developer, publishing colleagues, and our great friends at Kind of Funny. We appreciate everyone's support for the show and tuning in. It is going to be an amazing experience. But we also wanted to put a positive message out into the world during these uncertain times. We are all proud of what we've accomplished thus far with the Guerrilla Collective, as well as the message of being stronger united. But we cannot ignore the tragedies of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the other black victims of police brutality and racially motivated violence. Last weekend, we put together the Black Voices in Gaming stream with the support of our partners to share a positive message, as well as aid for those affected by the COVID-19 pandemic through the addition of a charity supported by Tiltify where you can donate to the streams. During the show, we will remind everyone ways that they can donate through the links below. Thanks for listening, supporting these movements, stay safe, and enjoy the Guerrilla Collective. Peace. Welcome to the Guerrilla Collective, a three-day digital festival of game announcements, trailers, and demos streamed straight to you. Please welcome your host, Game Awards trending gamer, Greg Miller. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Guerrilla Collective, live from our sanitized and empty studio. With E3 on the ropes this year, the Media Indie Exchange, the mix for short, and the Kind of Funny Games Showcase saw an opportunity to team up with amazing developers, publishers, and studios to help shine a spotlight on some of the coolest games around. And that's just what we're gonna do here with the Guerrilla Collective. Almost 80 teams have come together to bring you nearly 90 games spread out across three days right here on the screen of your choice. Right now, it's day one, and we could not think of a better way to welcome you to the collective than to bombard you with trailers, reveals, and titles you can play as soon as the show is over. But let's not waste any more time on little old me. Instead, let's start with a world premiere trailer no one's ever seen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is System Shock. World premiere.
world premiere. We started the Kind of Funny Games Showcase in 2018 as a way to use our platform to make sure indie games weren't lost in the wake of big budget titles. That's why teaming up with The Mix for the Guerrilla Collective made so much sense. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from The Mix, Justin Woodward. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. We started The Mix in 2012 with the goal of helping to create new ways for developers to get visibility for their games. The Guerrilla Collective is really an evolution of that concept where developers, large and small, showcase their games. Justin, you're a developer yourself. Why are indie games so important? Well, Greg, indie games are super important because the experiences that independent game developers invest their blood, sweat, and tears to create help to push gaming entertainment in the form of narrative, art, tech, and game design to new heights. Exactly. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why you got to support your indie devs, indie devs, with hot new titles just like these. Rocky is a modern-day tale of courage and adventure. A game about monsters that shouldn't exist. Join Tuve, a young girl touched by magic. Explore an uncharted world of hidden legends. Discover mysterious items and meet long-forgotten monsters. Solve ancient puzzles to unlock paths deeper into the forest. Draw maps, collect curiosities, and chart your adventure. Unveil the story of tragic loss and the path to redemption. Confront Tuve's past. Explore her memories. And learn the truth. Rocky, a game about monsters that shouldn't exist, but do.
Genesis Noir is kind of a combination of a creation myth and a film noir thriller. Hi, we're Feral Cat Den, a little design studio composed of myself, creative lead, Jeremy, technical lead. Hi, I'm Jeremy, the technical lead. So in some ways, our game is a traditional point and click in that, you know, you have the normal click to move your character around kind of thing. But in a lot of ways, it's not um, in that we don't really have tricky inventory puzzles where you have to like combine stuff together. It's a lot more about just kind of playing in space and the puzzles are meant to kind of evoke a vibe and a, and a feeling. Our emphasis is more on tactile kind of exploratory interactions. So you might uh, manipulate a planet's orbit or change the age of a sun. My skill set is definitely more 2D animation and graphic design. Jeremy is really into like VJing and generative art. Not only does a very black and white kind of simplified uh, visual representation enable us to kind of explore concepts of uh, on the cosmic scale and and in, in the noir kind of territory it's also you know stuff that we like making and you know, it was a very natural fit so of course we're inspired by you know the classic noir films which usually have a pretty jazzy soundtrack and we've kind of tried to bring a more cosmic style to that and inspired by stuff by Sun Ra and the uh, similar artists. Um, so we partnered with uh, these great musicians and sound designers in London called Skillbard, and they've really created this great dynamic soundtrack. Um, and there's a lot of synergy between the visuals and the audio that uh, feels really great, I think. This is uh, our first game that we've ever made, our first dabbling into Unreal. Jeremy and I had wanted to make a, a project together for quite some time. I brought this idea to him and it was kind of the perfect meeting point of all our different interests. So then we made a little two-week demo um, and we sent that around to a few friends and they were really encouraging and they suggested that we go to GDC and try to meet with some publishers. And so that, was, that went really well. So it was just really encouraging all around. Genesis Noir is inspired by primarily Cosmic Comics but so many other things from classic film noir, like The Third Man is a personal favorite. We're super inspired also by the world of jazz. Guys like Sun Ra, Miles Davis, the kind of spacier territory that jazz explores. Thanks for checking out Genesis Noir. We're really excited for you to play it. And uh, we look forward to destroying the Big Bang. Thanks for checking out our game and we hope you enjoy it. Bye. World Premiere. Product not yet rated. Welcome to Purgatory, the land of lost souls, the realms of madness. Does anyone have what it takes to survive the nightmares of this realm and open the doors of insanity? Join our hero riding his mighty steed on a quest of redemption. Monstrosities and damnation stand in their way. Armed with sword, shield, and mystical cards. No defense, just attack. They will carve a path of merciless terror through their enemy. Whoa. I mean, we just started. Um, let's try that again. Witness a world where chilling on a boat on the river sticks makes you look like a total badass. Because you know you won't be thrown overboard to hell. Because you are really, really awesome. Limbo cannot hold you. You deserve paradise. Use your sexy charms. Befriend a scary witch. Master spells with your magnificent mind. Summon awesome allies for your enchanted entourage. And give respect to beings of infinite powers. Hey, what a cool story. Using a new powerful deck of defense cards, you will block, parry, and repost your way to victory. Oh, not again. Were heroes always this fragile? <clears throat> Strap yourself in. Uh, again? Summon a 1940s boy band. No! Oh, 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 oh
honest, this is not going the way we wanted it to. Okay, come on. Alright, next hero. More me for the grind. <laughs> world where everyone dies and hope is futile. Yes! Alright! Good car choices, excellent equipment. Okay, solid tactics. We got this. We have our hero. Now, let's swing open the doors of insanity. Where no sword is too big, armor too thick, ally too obnoxious, in this totally awesome game that you should definitely buy. This is the story of a little juggler's girl. Trapped in her life, she wanted to see the world. Alone. And, oops, not quite alone. Careful, Abby. Careful where you flee. The world has worse on offer than the skin of your knee. As much as I wish that it weren't so, the way things are, are the way things go. I'm all you've got in this forsaken land, so hold back and trust in your narrator's hand. Exclusive. In Boyfriend Dungeon, you spend a summer in Verona Beach, California, fighting monsters for money. Except the swords you find in the dungeon can also transform into beautiful men, women, and non-binary people you can befriend or date. You try to get as far as you can in the dungeon each time, but dying's okay, because you can level up too. You need to get stronger to go further. To do that, you'll need a closer relationship with your weapon. You spend the game alternating between fighting in the dungeon and hanging out with your weapons around town. I personally get bored if there's only fighting, but also I get restless if there's too much reading, so we wanted to make a mix of the two.
Here, I'm dating Sunder the Talwar, and when we spend enough time together, we'll discover new abilities we can use in combat. Each weapon has a different set of upgrades to find with choices to make along the way. Different weapons have different preferences for where they want to go on dates, how they want to flirt, and what kinds of gifts they want to receive. They might give you a gift too. There's a variety of different kinds of people slash weapons to date in Boyfriend Dungeon, so it's up to you who you want to wield and level up your love. But watch out, there's someone out there kidnapping weapons. We're getting closer to finishing Boyfriend Dungeon now, and we hope people will love it as much as we do. If that sounds like your kind of game, wishlist Boyfriend Dungeon on Steam now. All that looked awesome, but it highlights my number one problem with showcases like ours, Justin. We show you all this cool stuff, and then you have to wait months to play it. Yo, I feel you, Greg. That's why we at the Gorilla Collective are putting an end to that right now. This next round of games share one amazing concept. They are all being released this month. Exclusive.
Okay, we just gave you a bunch of games you can play today, so I think it's okay to go back to teasing you. And let's start in a big way. Ladies and gentlemen, here's a brand new announcement trailer from Baldur's Gate 3. Exclusive. Consider your predicament. One skull, two tenants, and no solution in sight. I could fix it all like that. Try to cure yourself, shop around, beg, borrow, and steal. Exhaust every possibility until none are left. And when hope has been whittled down to the very marrow Despair. That's when you'll come knocking on my door. And welcome to community update number three for Baldur's Gate 3. I have great news today. We finally locked down our early access content and we decided that we're going to bring Baldur's Gate 3 for the very first time in your hands in August 2020. That's to say, maybe. And the maybe has everything to do, of course, with COVID-19. We've been hit like everybody else in the world. We've been working from home, which wasn't necessarily the easiest thing as game developers, because we like to huddle around the monitor and discuss about the things that are happening in the game. But nonetheless, we managed to make a lot of progress since you last saw the game at PAX East. So we think we're going to make it, depending on a couple of things. One of these things, for instance, is our performance capturing and motion capturing. Our people have started returning to the office. We've been uh, recording again. And if we can hit a certain speed in the recording, then we should be able to make it. The game is looking amazing. It is absolutely incredible to see how much progress has been made since PAX East. And I think when you'll see it, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, the visual fidelity has increased a lot. And the cool part is that actually, uh, we're going to launch a game in August in early access, but we still have an entire development period to go after that. So it's going to look even better by the time it's going to release. Uh, you will see things like improvement in combat. Uh, we did a lot of changes in how combat flows, how the camera moves. Uh, how the initiative system works. Uh, the, all together they make for a much more refined combat experience, which is a lot of fun, I can tell you that. There are changes in the way that we do our narrator. That was something that we had a lot of feedback on. Uh, there's uh, the integration of the rule set is getting better and better. So we were getting a really good handle on how to do things. And so it feels like a, a really, really cool game with a lot of depth when you play it now. Here's the really cool part. You don't have to wait until August 20 to 20 to see what I'm talking about because we'll do another gameplay live stream and we'll do it just in front of Dungeons & Dragons Live on June 18th. And you will decide for me whether or not I'm going to kill a hobgoblin who deserves to be killed, his name is Dror Raxin, or if I'm going to descend into the Underdark. I'm very much looking forward to it, so I hope to see you there on June 18th. It's going to be a lot of fun. Take care, bye-bye.
exclusive. They say there ain't no such thing as a good death. Depends on which side of the gun you're on and what you're fighting for. cursed or sent to the abyss but a few folks are looking out for me helping where they can others more problematic thing evil requires to succeed is for good men to do nothing. Living or dead, still true. And I'm through doing nothing. Hi, I'm uh, Tarn Adams. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Bay 12 Games, and we make the uh, game Dwarf Fortress. My brother Zach and I have been working on that game for a long time. It came out in 2006. But now we're bringing the game to Steam and Itch, and the biggest update about it is that we're bringing graphics to the game. Uh, the uh, artists, uh, Mike and Patrick, are longtime modders of the game, and um, now we're all working together to uh, give the game a, an overhaul and, and uh, hopefully uh, let a lot more people play it. Dwarf Fortress is a settlement management game uh, you have a group of dwarves that go out to make a fortress in a procedurally generated world. Um, that's the first part we'll be looking at here. Uh, so by procedurally generated world, we don't just mean a randomized map, but that it, it runs a history, a historical simulation uh, over a, a few hundred years, uh, if you want to let it keep running, uh, where civilizations spread out and uh, trade with each other, fight with each other, uh, magical things happen, strange things happen. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of little characters tracked uh, that you might see when you start playing your game. There are uh, all sorts of edges between things that you can see here, between the different biomes, little trees and mountains and so forth, uh, so that the, the picture is a little more readable than it was before. Uh, when it was uh, just squiggles and arrows, uh, and uh, you can you can see the the world develop as the the years pass, and uh, then you just plop down your dwarves and uh, start playing uh, in this environment. So when you start your fortress, you have uh, your your dwarves uh, and a wagon. Uh, and some animals to start with, and whatever else you would like to bring along. A uh, pick for mining, uh, buckets and ropes and uh, food, uh, alcohol, very important. General idea is that you'd want to just kind of lay out your things and dig into the mountain, make some, make some bedrooms, make some workshops, uh, allow people to start getting on with their lives here. So the big thing you might notice about this uh, area at first is that it has some three-dimensionality to it in the sense that there's uh, a hill and lower levels uh, and uh, that you can see going up and down. That was the big first project for the, uh, the artists and I to, to kind of work out how we're going to display uh, this uh, in, in, in text. You could just show some upward triangles. There's a ramp, go uphill. 
uh, and uh, you know that worked for a few people. Uh, but to try and generalize that, uh, we had to draw many, 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 many cases of uh, ramps and get them displayed. Um, and you know, but it looks cool now. Here they are. Uh, we have all, all sorts of ramps and things. Uh, and um, then there's lots of workshop pictures to do, lots of item pictures to do. Uh, our dwarves are all just sort of this one placeholder dwarf right now, but we'll have different uh, different faces and clothing and things for the different appearances of the dwarves. All the dwarves have a... Back in the, the text version, it was just a giant text paragraph describing what the dwarf looks like, but now you'll be able to see some of that. Uh, so yeah, that no, was pretty exciting. Uh, the the um, you know we're we're still at the early stages. You can see with the the text graphics um, that are still around the edges and and so forth uh, that we're going to update. This is all very kind of preliminary uh, as we're working through it, but uh, it should be should be uh, pretty cool by the time we're done. Uh, and we have. Um, you know, a lot more uh, to, to work on, and then that means a lot more uh, kind of news to share as we go, as we update the pictures and the also the usability of the game uh, so that it'll be easier to get into. Um, and uh, yeah, so thanks for watching. Are you ready to find the next game you'll love more than anything else? That's the worst transition of the show, I promise. Check out these gameplay updates from some of our closest friends. Exclusive.
Hi everyone and welcome to 11-Bit Studio Show in the Gorilla Collective. You know us from the titles like Frostpunk, This War of Mine, Moonlighter, Children of Morta, and more. First up, let's visit the home of the Bergson family, the protagonists of Children of Morta, a story-driven roguelite action RPG set in a mesmerizing fantasy world. It's just got a new Game Plus free update, but there's more content coming. Here are a few words from Marek Zimak, executive producer at 11-Bit Studios. Hey guys, we hope you're doing okay. Luckily, we're fine and we're working harder than ever. Children of Morta has a very special place in our hearts. And we also know that many of you out there really enjoy that game. Our previous free DLC has added new Game Plus mode to the game. But this is not the end of the story of Children of Morta. Obviously, there's more content coming. We know that when it comes to RPG games, new characters are in high demand. This is exactly what we will focus on in our next free update called Bergson's Home. We will be bringing you a brand new playable character to enjoy. Our brave hero merchant Will from Moonlighter is never tired of adventures. Between Dimensions DLC has just released on consoles. And now, Will is packing his backpack to discover the lands of mobile gaming. Here's Javier Jimenez, Digital Sun CEO. Hi there, folks. This is Javi from Digital Sun. It has already been two years since we released Moonlighter. It's been quite a ride for us, and we want to thank you all. We are celebrating this anniversary by releasing the Moonlighter DLC Between Dimension on all consoles. We know some of you have been waiting for, for that for quite a while, so we hope it's worth the time. And we are also announcing that we are releasing Moonlighter Mobile later this year. Uh, the mobile version of Moonlighter is going to be something quite fresh and quite new because we try to rebuild it. So it feels like a native mobile experience. It has new controls, it has a new graphic user interface, it has new approach to combat. So we think it's going to feel not like a simple port, but something that it's actually working as a native game. We want to share with you some bits of videos we have of the current gameplay so you can take a glimpse into what's coming. And that's everything I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much and see you soon. The scouts have brought news from the farthest, coldest corners of Frostland. The population of New London, humanity's hope, has survived. But was it all worth it? Here's a special reveal from Frostpunk's lead designer, Kuba Stokalski. Hello, everyone. Frostpunk is a grim society survival city building game. In January, it got a prequel expansion called The Lost Autumn, which enables you to see what happens just before the icy apocalypse. This new expansion tells a story of citizens of New London on a special assignment after the Great Storm. It opens not only a brand new chapter in the Frostbound universe, but pits you against new challenges and new gameplay mechanics, both in the city and on the Frostland map, and reaching the experience. A brand new Frozen board is set, and the pieces are moving. What does it mean for you as the leader, and what fate awaits your society? Well, for now, I'm not going to spoil anything else. Let's just take a look at this short teaser we've prepared. They say that the snow is dead. But we've learned to the contrary. The universe of Frostpunk holds even more fascinating secrets. The next one should be really exciting, especially for fans of board games. Frostpunk is going offline. Here's Jacob Vizhnevsky from Glass Cannon Games to unveil this mystery. Hi there, I'm Kuba Vizhnevsky from Glass Cannon. Some of you might remember me as the co-author of the highly acclaimed This World of Mine, the board game. Now, together with Adam Kwapiński, author of the best-selling Nemesis the Board Game, and my team, I'm super hyped to bring you an ice-cold tabletop experience. Ladies and gentlemen, Frostbank is officially going unplugged. The core gameplay will be, as you could imagine, morally complex and highly, highly challenging. We're working very hard to bring the emotions from the video game to your tables. Frostbank the Board Game 
is going to be a deeply strategic, yet easy to learn, hope experience full of tough choices, narrative depth, immersive gameplay, snow and despair. As you can see, there are some exciting adventures ahead of us. That's not all though. We're also working on some exciting in-house projects, as well as collaborating with other studios like Fool's Theory. A new game from Digital Sun Games is coming as well. And trust us when we say, there's more where that came from. That concludes the news from 11-Bit Studios. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and subscribe to the newsletter to always be up to date with the latest news. Stay safe and thanks for watching.
world premiere. time. Can you believe that my part of day one is almost over, people? Listen, we know you got literally nowhere else to go, but we also know that if you're like us, you're antsy for more of that new hotness. So before we hand the stream off to the Paradox Insider, here are a couple more world premieres. World premiere. <laughs> Ooh. Mm -hmm. 
Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up my section of the Gorilla Collective's first day, but we are far from done. Up next is the Paradox Insider, where Paradox Interactive is going to share deeper details on the latest games they've been working on. Let's check in with Paula Tellen over in the Paradox studio. How's it going over there, Paula? Hi, Greg. We're doing great. We've been watching the show and we love it. So I'm just a little bit annoyed that we have to start our own presentation because that means we have to stop watching all of the cool content that you've shown so far. I'm sure your stuff is also reasonably cool, or at least fun to watch. Well, we're about to find out. The Paradox team have been working from home lately, so we're super excited to show the world outside what we've been working on this spring. Cool stuff, I'm looking forward to it. So let's start the countdown and stay tuned for Paradox Insider. Hello, and thanks for joining us for the first ever Paradox Insider. My name is Paula, and I'm the event manager at Paradox. And joining me here is my good friend, Sean, who is not a vampire, but the brand manager for World of Darkness. And I don't know about you, Sean, but I think it is wonderful to be here for our part in this grand celebration of games. Absolutely, it's fantastic to be in a room with people again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, we, we'd love to be in all the many, many rooms around the world that we're normally in with our players in Los Angeles, in Cologne, yeah. having the conversations that we love to have. Uh, but unfortunately, we can't, so we've got the next best thing. We're coming straight to your living room. Yeah, and it also feels great that we're able to do something proactive about this and actually yeah, reach the world outside, show them what we've been working on this spring and so on. 
Absolutely. This week. I mean, mm. we've all been working from home at Paradox, yeah. but uh, our studios haven't let them that stop them. They've mm. been working from their living rooms, from their bedrooms, from their bathrooms. It's uh, it's going to be a non-stop gaming fest today. We're going to hear from the teams behind Crusader Kings 3, Empire of Sin, Prison Architect, Surviving the Aftermath. We'll have a special message from Hearts of Iron 4. And of course, the one game that I am 100% unbiased towards, despite the blood bonds, Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2. All right, let's not waste any more time, Paula. Why don't you kick it off with uh, the team behind Crusader Kings 3? All right, it is time to get this show started. It's time to dive into the treacherous world of Crusader Kings 3 with a fresh look at live gameplay from our newest grand strategy game. Please give a warm welcome, which we'll happily accept over the internet, to game designer Alexander Ultner and community developer Rod Del Rue. Hi, Paula. Thanks for having us. Hi, welcome. Thank you. So you just dropped some major news for Crusader Kings. Mm -hmm. The game will be released on September 1st, yes. which is literally around the corner, and pre-orders are live right now. Mm -hmm. Rod, how has the reception in the community been so far? It's been so good. Uh, people are really appreciating the dev diaries that we're putting forward. Uh, we have fans that have loved seeing the new religious system that we have and also the lifestyle still system that adds, to, you know, just that little extra layer of RPG. So it's been pretty good. We're super happy. Good. And uh, Alex, how is the mood in the dev team right now? Oh, it's uh, fantastic. The team has been working really, really hard. And of course, it's both frightening and exciting to get feedback from our fans like this. We love the game and we love all the feedback we're getting. And we're counting down the hours to September 1st. Wonderful. Rod, uh, tell us a little bit about what you have prepared for us today. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to start with one of the most interesting starting positions in CK3, which is going to be in Spain. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, what we want to showcase here is the various decisions that are open to you even before you press play and start playing. It's like taking a look at the various challenges that you are facing before you start the game. Cool. Well, let's dive in, shall yeah, we? Sure. All right. The year is uh, 1066, and we are located in northern Spain. Of course, it's not Spain yet, and it won't be for another 400 years, unless we expedite the process. Northern Spain is uh, divided into a number of uh, Catholic kingdoms that stand against the powerful Moorish realms of the south. In northwestern Iberia, we have three kingdoms ruled by three brothers. We have Galicia, we have Castile, and us in Leon. One new feature in Crusader Kings 3 is the Issues widget at the top. And if we click it, we can see that we are in line to inherit both Galicia and Castile. And see, this is what makes this starting position super interesting. We are playing as Leon, and the only thing that is standing between us and the throne of Galicia is our Castilian brother. And we need to attack him first before rushing for Galicia. If we look at the map, we can see that Galicia is the one that is most open to Moorish attacks. Castile and Leon both have uh, southern mountains that uh, provide a very defensible advantage. Um, if we compare army sizes, we can clearly see that Castile has the biggest army, while we have a middling army. And the young, uh, the young king of Galicia has the smallest army. Um, none of us really have an edge over the other but we might be able to find an ally to support us. And in Crusader Kings, this might mean marriage, right? Absolutely, Paola. Marriage is super key in Crusader Kings 3. If you don't have a marriage, you don't have any allies. And I think we should take a look at the various Iberian uh, countries that we have around us, and I think an Aragon princess would do just fine. Indeed, this Aragonese princess will get us their armies on our side. Next, let's take a look at our king. So all characters in CK3 have five different skills. And we can see here that King Alfonso is very good at intrigue, which means that he can plot and scheme very effectively. And if we appoint 
a skilled spy master to support our schemes, and we get a spouse that enhances our intrigue, we can become even better. And to top it all off, we will pick a lifestyle that really accentuates this focus on scheming. We will pick the skullduggery focus. Yeah, absolutely. And it's key here to lean into in intrigue. And why is that? Because like Alex was mentioning, we have evenly matched forces against Castille. So we should really lean into that intrigue and start a murder plot to get rid of the brother. <laughs> okay, so the plan is to kill the brother here. Alex, are we moving forward with this? Indeed. Uh, we're going to try and murder our brother. As you can see, we have a 50% chance of succeeding. And uh, if we are lucky, we can even find more agents in the court of our target that might be convinced by a slight bribe. Yeah, and that's the cool thing with Crusader Kings, right? If you're trying to plot a murder against someone and you don't have enough power to succeed, you can bribe people, but you also have a special perk in the Intrigue lifestyle, which essentially allows you to find secret and dirt on people in your court and then force them to join your plot. Oh, so many different options, but unfortunately we're running out of time here. Uh, but Alex, how do you think that this, this story will play out? Oh, there are so many unanswered questions. Uh, will our plot, plot against our Castilian brother succeed? Will we gain Galicia before uh, Galicia manages to produce um, a legitimate heir? Will we be able to leverage the armies from Castile and Aragon to take over Galicia in time? Can we contain all of this familial treason before we have to fight external <laughs> enemies? There are millions of ways for this to play out. Yeah, I guess we'll have to wait a little bit longer, but thank you so much for taking us thank through you, a short thank you. snippet of the drama that you can expect in Crusader Kings 3. Due to be released on September 1st and available for pre-order now. Well, betrayal, assassination, treason, <laughs> kind of feels like we're having a paradox show already. Yeah, 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 I agree. It went down a dark path pretty fast there. Good. But I guess that the next game that we have lined up is not going to disappoint us either. I mean, building a crime empire in the 1920s Chicago is not something that you're going to get away with without bribing a few cops, breaking a few alliances, maybe cutting some questionable deals on the black market. What do you think? Underhanded tactics, politics, taking over the city. These are all things that are very close to where my heart once was. Next up is Empire of Sin. And joining me here in the studio from the Empire of Sin team are Ian O'Neill, lead combat designer, and Brenda Romero, game director for Empire of Sin, both from Romero Games. Thanks for joining us, guys. Hey, everybody. Hi, guys. So, Brenda, tell me, what inspired you to make a game about 1920s gangsters? Uh, you know, it's, it's more like what couldn't have possibly inspired me. I mean, we've wanted to make this game for a long time. It is, it's an incredibly rich space. It's 1920s, Prohibition era Chicago. You have a lot of larger than life personalities like Al Capone and Frankie Donovan and Goldie Garneau that are, that are there at the time. And, you know, what's not to love? Uh, the stories, the personalities were made for a strategy game. And, as with many game designers, if you really want to play something and it's not there, then you make it. Absolutely. Uh, so why don't you tell us how all of that figures into gameplay? What do we have here? In Empire of Sin, you can play as one of 14 different bosses. And it's a great mix of factual and fictional bosses, each with their own bonuses and special abilities. And today we're going to play as one Mr. Dean O'Banion. Okay, so tell me a little bit about Dean. What's his background? What kind of person is he? Well, he grew up in Chicago, actually, in an area known as Little Hell. And in spite of that, or possibly because of it, Dean had strong ties to the church, which influenced many of the decisions he made, but clearly not all of them. Dean actually owned a flower shop, and from there he ran his rackets. Okay, very cool. Do, do all the bosses have their own missions? Indeed they do. Dean's just about to head off to meet with Father Higgins here, which will kick off his boss mission. Now, Dean's used to walking the streets of Chicago, but we can also take a look at things from the world map to get a good idea of what's going on. 
Here we see Dean having a bit of a holy sit-down with the good Father Higgins. Now, Father Higgins has received word that a brothel has opened up in a neighborhood nearby. And if there's one thing that Dean cannot abide, it's brothels. There are several things Dean could pick to say here, but he does what he needs for the good of the church. Ah, you're a good lad, Dean. Father Higgins offers him $500 from the coffers. Now you can choose what you want to choose, but me, I'm always going to pick the cash. And a good blessing for the soul certainly can't hurt. <laughs> right oh, but uh, how will Dean handle this then? Well, in Empire of Sin, diplomacy happens one of two ways. It's either going to happen by breath or by bullet. And either we're going to talk it out and things are going to come to some kind of arrangement or they're going to go south real quick. So Dean knows just the man for the job. And his name is George Moran. And he's a regular at one of Dean's establishments. You can see him there at the bar. So George is tight with the church too, but his morals are pretty loose. And here he's telling Dean that some guy is in from New York who he thinks has a pretty serious attitude problem. Problem. And George wants Dean to keep an eye on him, but Dean already knows a bit more. Now, the story ends up taking some surprising turns and getting pretty deep, but for now, Dean just wants to get the good father's deed done. Okay, but it uh, doesn't really sound like a one-man job. Is he going to get any help? Oh, that's what I'm thinking too. In Empire Sin, there are 60 gangsters of varying skill levels that you can hire to join your crew. Me? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hire on Maria Rodriguez and Guido Savone. Now, I've fought with these guys before, and they're fantastic. Gangsters develop loyalty to their boss the longer that they work together, and they also have an indiv individual attribute called morale, which affects how they perform. We know that every boss in Empire of Sin has their own uh, combat ability. What's Dean's speciality? Oh, yes. Dean's combat ability is a ranged attack known as Blasphemy. Now, there were many accounts of Dean's brutal attacks during the Chicago newspaper wars, where O'Banion and his crew were known as sluggers and they would beat up the competition for rival newspapers. This often resulted in really close range uh, gunfights. This was where I drew the inspiration for Blasphemy. Using this move, Dean will fire a custom shotgun slug at the target, and when the slug hits the target, it explodes. But I really wanted to add something extra, something that would give this ability a bang. That's when I decided that Dean's boss ability would be devastating to heavily armored foes. I wanted to shred their armor completely. And not just one target, but multiple targets. And as a final piece of the puzzle, the name. An awful, brutal attack delivered by a foe that saw himself as a saint. Blasphemy was a most fitting title. Oh man, it is a perfect title and a great move. So here we can see that Dean is done and he, he did what he needed to do, but there's a whole lot of Chicago beyond this. Dean's going to settle things here with Father Higgins, but like I said, it isn't over by a long shot, and it's going to take some surprising turns. In all of these stories, they're nothing compared to the stories that the player will tell on their way to the top of Chicago. That is mission complete. Very cool, guys. You know, speaking of family connections, I've actually got a contingent out your way in County Galway. There's a Greenies pub not far from you guys. Well, uh, now that we know about it, I'd say it's not for long. Uh, do you have any idea what their security is like? We could use another racket. I don't know how thick the walls are or how many cameras they've got, but give it a try and we'll <laughs> see who gets who. Thanks for joining us, guys. All right, all right. Guru Mina Mahagets. Slana Wally, folks. And Empire of Sin will come to both PC and console in autumn of this year, 2020. So I was standing here on the side, just wishing I could play Brenda Romero in the game. I'm absolutely certain you can. She's definitely snuck herself in that somewhere. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. She is the coolest. Um, but Sean, it seems like you left out an important piece of your backstory that I haven't heard At before. least one important piece. Yeah, yeah, we'll see about that. But your family owns a pub in Ireland. Yeah, definitely. So my distant family does have a pub <laughs> in County Galway. Uh, but you know, I mean, every family has some skeletons in the closet. I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure your family is no different. Oh, well, most likely, but I don't know. The, there's a Tallinn bakery in Stockholm, okay. for whatever that's worth. Yeah. yeah, I can see some dark stories there. We've got cinnamon buns, we've got yeah. Swedes. I think we've got some bribing Swedes with uh, sweet cinnamon buns. <laughs> What do you think about this guy, though, who have been standing here staring us out the entire time? You're just you, blinking as yeah, well. Yeah, I know. Do you think we could um, 
bribe whom with some cinnamon buns? No, I think this guy is more into to whiskey and cinnamon bun sized holes in his enemies. And from one game about managing organized crime to another about managing criminals, it's time for Prison Architect. That is island bound. Let's check in with the team and first give a polite welcome, which won't disturb your neighbors, to product manager Stacy McElwam. Welcome. Hi, thank you. <laughs> God, there's it's a catchy trailer you have there. Yes, right? <laughs> yeah. Everyone in the studio were just like, dancing along. Uh, but you have an expansion coming up, Island Bound, that will be the first expansion in Prison Architect history that will ship simultaneously on PC and console. It will be. Stacey, what can you tell us about this expansion? Yeah, so Island Bound is built from the ground up in order to expand and enhance the core gameplay of Prison Architect. This is really exciting because it means that for the first time you can actually build a real island prison uh, completely independent of the road. So you no longer need to use the road if you don't want to. It also means that for the first time you can oversee the world's most iconic island prison, Alcatraz, mm -hmm. on the new Alcatraz map. And it means that you can reimagine your transportation and deliveries completely with new features like docks, helipads, helicopters, boats and ferries. And of course we have a cool new elite ops and a new uh, air fire unit that can be called in during an emergency. Yeah, it's very cool. A lot of stuff. A lot of new stuff. So uh, let's check in with the team at Double Eleven. Joining us here is Gas Wright, Game Design Manager, and Natalie Wicks, Product Design Manager. Welcome. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. So Gas, it generally sounds like there's a lot of things in this expansion. Yeah, there is. There is. And all of the content that's coming with Island Bound will integrate seamlessly with Prison Architect's existing mechanics. Um, so it adds a lot more variety and depth to the game. And even if you don't um, want to build an island prison every single time, all the new features, the docks, helipads, helicopters, boats, ferries, um, new emergency services, new security um, features, they'll all um, work with your existing saves as well as new prisons that you might build on the land. And also we have a free update that's launching on the same day with Island Bound. This update is called The Rock and introduces dynamic prisoner reputations. So players will see prisoners gaining and losing reputations dynamically while spending time in their prison based on their actions, their experiences and where they spend their time. Cool. And always nice with free updates. Natalie, can you tell us a little bit about how the game has evolved during this past year? Yeah, uh, we've been very busy over the last year. Um, so I think as of next week, we will have launched hundreds of community improvements to the game. And that's alongside the three expansions we've also released since then. So there was Psych Ward Warden's edition, uh, Cleared for Transfer, and now Island Bound. Um, so, and the, all of these added new mechanics to the base game as well. So uh, for example, uh, Psych Ward added Insane Inmates, um, Cleared for transfer, added prison privileges and security transfers. And finally, Island Bound will let people create the prison island of their dreams. Ah, oh, <laughs> we're so much looking forward to it. But if we look more into the future, what is next for Prison Architect? Natalie, can you tell us anything about the future plans? Uh, no, like I can tell you that we do have a lot of plans for console and PC, but I'm afraid you will have to wait till later in the year for more information. Right, but then there will be more. 
Yes, but uh, you'll have to keep your eyes open. But I can tell you that just like Island Bound, future expansions will be released on both PC and console. Yes, so thank you for joining us, Stacy, Gas, Natalie, and good luck with the new expansion. Thank you so much. Island Bound and the free update, The Rock, will be available soon, so stay tuned. Wow, okay, well, I'm, I'm curious. What kind of warden would you be? Ooh, good question. Uh, I would probably build a beautiful but highly insufficient and shitty prison, to be honest. What about you, Sean? Well, I think what I would do is um, I'd look for a really big island, yeah. like a continent. And then I would put all the snakes and all the spiders <laughs> on the continent and probably an opera house. I see where this is going. Okay. From one management game where everyone wants to get out to a management game where everyone wants to get in. Here is Surviving the Aftermath. And joining me here in the studio is Stefan Eld and Lasse Liliadal, the product manager and game director for Surviving the Aftermath. Now guys, I, I notice a disturbing lack of vampires and werewolves in this game, so you're gonna have to explain it to somebody who hasn't yet picked it up. Well, Surviving the Aftermath is a post of Apocalyptic survival colony builder. It's, uh, it's quite a mouthful to Short say. Genre. Um, anyway, the basic premise is that you need to build the perfect disaster proof colony in a post apocalyptic world. And in order to do so, you need to uh, harvest and collect resources, you need to build your colony, you need to protect it from hostile environments or rival societies, and, and much, much more. Okay, so it's a survival colony builder. I mean, that, that is a relatively broad genre. Lasse, could you, could you tell me how Surviving the Aftermath stands out? Yeah, the game is more than a colony builder. It adds strategic layers of gameplay by opening up the outside world beyond the colony. And the world map is actually one of the key features we have spent a lot of time creating. And in the world map, players can send teams of specialists to gather resources and intelligence about the world around their colony. And there they can encounter also other societies, which can be friendly or not. And, but they will react to players' reputation and decisions throughout the game. So one thing that I noticed since I saw you two together last is a, a little change of uh, outfit here. Everyone will remember who's been following this game, how you announced it in your fantastic hazmat suits. You've updated your wardrobe, and I know you've been updating the game as well. So, so what's changed since we, uh, we last saw you in Berlin? So we've had seven major content updates, and each of those updates has introduced new features, such as new trading system with other societies, vehicles that make movement in the world map much more efficient. And we also reworked the tech tree completely and expanded it quite drastically. And one of the most recent features is a combat system, which includes a colony combat where you defend your colony against raiding bandits and have other smaller encounters with wild beasts that are roaming in the nature around your colony. And maybe one more thing to mention is the criminality system, which concerns every colonist in the game. Okay, Stefan, but what about uh, Steam players? When will they be able to get Surviving the Aftermath? We will be bringing Surviving the Aftermath to Steam Early Access in October. Don't forget to wishlist it. And uh, ever since we released the game last year, we have been receiving tons of good feedback from players. And, uh, we're hoping to develop the game with the feedback that we can get from the Steam community as well. And uh, in fact, with the feedback that we have received, we felt that we need to add more updates to the roadmap so we can put all that content into the game that we know that the players want and that the community deserves. So with all of these updates uh, that have come along, obviously viewers are wondering what's next. Can, lastly, can you give us a sneak preview? Of course. Uh, update 8, tainted, called Tainted Earth, will be available on June 18th to all Surviving the Aftermath players. And in this update, we focus on pollution, which further deepens this aspect of the game by adding different pollution strengths and an area of er effect around the pollution dep deposits and catastrophes that makes the pollution levels rise. And I might say that this is our biggest update yet for the game. 
Fantastic. Uh, well, for new players like myself, where can I get started with uh, surviving the aftermath? Well, as I mentioned before, you can wishlist it on Steam now, and uh, where it will be out in early access on October 22nd this year. Uh, and you can also get it on Epic Game Store and Xbox Game Preview already. And our plan is to have the game leave early access in early 2021. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us, Lasse. Thank you for joining us, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you. That was Surviving the Aftermath. So that was a very smooth Surviving yeah. the Aftermath stream. No catastrophes, uh, nothing leaked, no radiation and so on, like we're used to seeing the usual gameplay streams. Yeah, fair call, fair call. But let's move on from uh, one game about surviving an apocalypse to another about surviving your own immortality. But first, we have something special for Paradox fans and strategy players everywhere. It's the fourth anniversary of Hearts of Iron 4, so we want to congratulate the team on going four on four. And here's a little something from the game team and game director, Don Lind. Hi, my name is Dan and I'm the game director for Hearts of Iron 4. And I'm here today because this is the fourth anniversary for the game. So I want to say thank you for all our supporters and all the feedback and all the great mods you guys have been doing. The community is bigger than it's ever been and it's just amazing to be part of that. And also, I want to tell you guys that it doesn't really stop here. We've got a lot more cool Hearts of Iron stuff coming up in the future, so definitely look forward to that. In 2016, Paradox released the ultimate grand strategy war game. Over the years, the game has expanded, and tools of history has evolved. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen, you are about to embark upon the Great Crusade. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall never surrender. The new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. And a big congratulations to Hearts of Iron 4 on four years. All right, family, we've got quite the treat for you today. We recently showed you the wholesome and rhythmic way in which Kindred celebrate the holidays on our Xbox Series X showcase. But what you saw was only most of the trailer. What we have for you today is what we're calling the Prince's Cut with a very special guest appearance. So I suggest you stick around. We're also gonna find out what you get when you pre-order the Bloodlines 2 Collector's Edition. And joining me here in the studio today is Nick Artali, lead producer at Paradox Interactive. Hello, everyone. And Rachel Leica, lead creative designer at Hardsuit Labs. Hello. Now, these guys have all the gruesome details, but let's start with what is your favorite part of the collector's edition, Nikki? That will be the Elise statue. Of course. And that's because she's my favorite character. But also, since I lived in Seattle for six months, uh, it's really good to have a map I've kept as a memento. And it's quite a faithful recreation of Seattle, as yeah, I understand it. Yeah, exactly. Cartoonified. Very, very cool. And Rachel, what's your favorite part of the collector's edition? 
I'm a big fan of that seven inch vinyl of the uh, the original soundtrack. It's a really stunning physical copy um, of that of the really really amazing soundtrack. Uh, made partially by Rick Schaefer, composer from the original game. So I'm pretty excited to throw that on my turntable. I don't think you'll be the only one. Any Bloodlines fan have that theme stuck in their head. We've teased it enough. It's time to find out which kindred survived those Los Angeles nights and the long, long road to Seattle. And the back of your head's gonna be so full of phosphorus, it'll be a war crime. That's right, everybody. Damsel is back for Bloodlines 2. We are so excited to be able to announce this that we have that she has returned for our game. Uh, she has spent her her time in California since the first game, uh, establishing the Anarch Free State there, and now she's on her way to the Pacific Northwest to, to, to spread that good, good Anarch word. Ugh, Bruja and Anarch. I can almost feel the rabble's blood rising. Where's the Justicar when you need one? But, okay, clan critique aside, one of the great things about Damsel that old fans loved was the voice actress. Yeah. That was Courtney Taylor, and she's reprising her role as Damsel, which is super exciting. Okay, good to hear I won't be forced to fleshcraft anybody's voice box into anybody else. But is there anything else that you guys would like to share with the viewers about Bloodlines 2? Rachel? Well, we're just really excited for people to start playing the game and kind of find out what kind of monster you're going to become. Uh, you can make all kinds of choices in this game. You can do all kinds of things. You can glide ac across rooftops. You can use your powers of vampiric persuasion to get what you want out of people. Uh, you can even uh, dance your way into certain people's hearts if that is what you would like to do. Um, there are many ways to be a, a vampire in, in this game. Uh, of course, the right answer is to be a Bruja, because we have cool jackets and are pros at rabble-rousing. 
Okay, there you have it. The one defining feature of Bruja is their 80s fashion sense. And thanks for joining us via link, Rachel, and thanks for coming into the studio, Nikki. That was Rachel Laika and Nick Atali from the Bloodlines 2 team. Thank you, Cher. <laughs> Seriously, that trailer really creeps me out. It gets me every time. Whew. But I can't believe that Damsel is in the game. It, I'm just thinking cosplay potential for all the future events. Well, definitely. You could also be thinking, well, the Anarch Scum have revealed their position. And uh, with the Archons moving swiftly towards Seattle, I think that's a wrap. I think so, too. We've experienced murders and betrayals in Crusader Kings 3. We've met a boss in Empire of Sin. Trapped convicts on an island in Prison Architect. Balanced the needs of our survivors with the needs of the environment in Surviving the Aftermath. Celebrated Hearts of Iron 4. And reconnected with her fan favorite and my old enemy in Vampire the Masquerade, Bloodlines 2. We hope that you've enjoyed this insider look. Please stay safe, stay sane, wash your hands and play some games. That's all from Stockholm. Have a good night. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up the Guerrilla Collective's first day, but we are far from done. Of course, we've shown you a bunch of games you can get today, but we've also partnered with Steam. You can head over there to the Guerrilla Collective section, you can wishlist the games, you can show these developers love. Beyond that, you can catch the PC Gaming Show today at 11 a.m. Pacific, and then you can catch the Future Game Show at 2 p.m. Pacific. If that wasn't enough, we're back with day two of the Gorilla Collective tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific with even more reveals, trailers, and demos. And then we wrap up Monday starting at 9 a.m. Pacific with extended gameplay sessions with the developers. You won't want to miss any of it, I swear. But until next time, no, it's been our pleasure to serve you. The Gorilla Collective thanks its gold sponsor, ID at Xbox as well as all of these supporting sponsors.